Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 22 of my KSP campaign. Mm -hmm. The completion mm -hmm. of those two rescue missions in the last uh, episode left me with a couple of contracts to fill, and one of the ones I noticed right off the bat was this remote tech contact, or contract, <laughs> to point a dish out from Kerbin. I mean, really, could it be that easy? Let's see here, it says... We'd like you to point a dish at one of Kerbin's moons so we can start sending some probes that way. Well, I got dishes pointed at Kerbin's moons. Vessel any connected to KSP KSC. Okay, that's so that I got tons of satellites doing that. Point dish at one of Kerbin's moons. Has to be a dish antenna. Can open and go to the moon. Really? I mean, I, I I have five satellites out in orbit. Could I really just go to one of those and just point the dish antenna and boom, contract done for free? I guess there's only one way to find out, so I have to pick up two. So I picked up this uh, plant a flag on the moon. Not that I'm quite ready to put a Kerbal on the moon just yet, but, uh, you know, keep that one in reserve. And uh, get the remote tech contract, and then let's go out to ComSat 1 and see if it's as easy as it seems to be. Okay, so we'll select that dish antenna. Oh, that one's already pointing at Minmus. I don't know if it matters, but I noticed the first one was pointing at the moon. So activate, pointing at the moon. <laughs> Contract complete. Performing shakedown. So, con it, yeah, so what's that? A day? A day? Oh, two hours. Okay, two days. Uh, so it's just got uh, two days from now, as long as the connection remains, which it will. Um, Contract complete. Well, life doesn't get any easier than that. So we'll just skip on over to the next day, and you can see here in the building queue, once I get it up here, that uh, Corpalo 1 is just about two and a half hours away, and you will be seeing that this episode. In fact, that's what this episode is going to be about. We're going to talk about gravity sys. It's going to be great. But I have enough money now to upgrade the research and development center, but what I'm noticing here is I still have five more nodes on that tier five. So I still got quite a lot of science to unlock. I don't have to upgraded just yet so I decided instead I'm gonna go for the administrative building it's a lot cheaper to upgrade and this is going to allow me to step up my contracts to get more than or contract strategies get more than one strategy going at the same time get it up to 60 percent commitment that should help me generate more funds and more science so I think that's a more useful thing to do first again that's gonna take some time to build it's gonna take 10 days for it to be upgraded that's okay in the meantime uh, I have now unlocked fuel systems, that tech node, and uh, it gives me fuel lines, and that's given me a bit of an idea. With the Kerpalo just about complete, I need to get something else into the building queue to take advantage of that extra service bay. And up to the right here, we have my three missions that are kind of rocket appropriate um, that I have available to me. And the one, the one in the middle is the one I'm really looking at, this Rescue Tamley Kerman. She is in an orbit, this crazy high orbit. I've had this contract actually for quite some time. In fact, it was the first Rescue a Kerbal mission contract that I got. And it, it, the, her orbit is way out past the moon. And so I've been saving it because I got this idea to build a vessel. This is it here. This is called the Karine, and I'm keeping it hidden underneath this fairing. Because what I want to do is build a vessel that will stay in space permanently. Um, and it will be able to get pretty much anywhere within the Kerbin system. That's the idea. So it can go to Minmus, it can go to the moon, it can come back, it can go to higher orbits and around Kerbin. So what I was thinking about is building this whole thing and using it to do a lot of things in the future. Uh, Rescue Tamley being one of them. Another plan I have is to get out to ComSat-1, which is actually serving no purpose whatsoever, refueling it um, and putting it into a more useful place. Uh, I could even use it, I wasn't just thinking about this right now, I could even use it to potentially launch a lander, attach it to it, take it out to the moon and do a moon landing. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with this vessel, just keep refueling it, keep restocking it. But I don't have, the, the problem with it is, well there's two problems. One is that I don't quite have the parts unlocked that I need. One big one being docking ports, I haven't unlocked docking ports net yet. Another one being these KAS fuel pipes that you can use to um, to uh, connect two vessels, whether they have docking ports or not, and transfer resources between them. Uh, but then I realized, you know, with KAS and 
KIS, Kerbal Inventory System, you actually have the ability to do some building out in space. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to get this thing up there now, right? I'm going to have that service bay available pretty soon. I'm going to get that thing up there now. The problem with it is, well, it's pretty freaking heavy. And I, you know, I don't have really big uh, boosters unlocked yet. I don't have really big engines unlocked yet. That engine that you see on the bottom, that's the biggest engine that I have. So I got into this thing like, you know, probably the best plan is to use the fuel lines that I've just unlocked and uh, do some liquid fuel boosters and do some asparagus staging. And asparagus staging might be something that you've uh, uh, seen before. It's a very efficient way to design your rockets but it's very efficient because what it does is it makes the most use of your engines at a time what i'm going to be doing is firing all five of these engines at the same time okay now you might be going oh my god that's you know then once what you're just going to use up all that fuel and then you're done no 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 like you have to use the fuel lines to control the way the fuel gets used if we take a look at Kerbal Engineer, it's telling us that this particular vessel has a total delta V of 3740 meters per second, which really, really sucks. That's including the vessel itself. So the whole thing can barely get into orbit and not do much of anything else. Now, one way in which to attach these fuel lines is to attach them from the boosters. I got four-way symmetry on, by the way, now to the main vessel in the middle. And what that does now is those booster tanks are all going to feed into the middle vessel. So the boosters will all drain while that middle vessel stays full. And just with that, this thing now has 4,316 meters per second of delta V. Just that one simple change. But we can do much better than that. If we take one of these fuel lines, I'm now trying to get it down there, just a one-way single symmetry, so just one, and connect that booster to its neighbor like that then we take another fuel line and attach that neighbor to the main tank okay and we keep going around we take the next booster attach it to its neighbor and then we take that final fourth booster and attach it to the main vessel all right so let's explain what's going on here um what we have are two boosters feeding into the other two boosters, which in turn, those two boosters are feeding into the main vessel. So why, why is that helping? Well, let's take a look at this booster on the right. The booster on the right is feeding into the booster on the left, and the booster on the left is feeding into the main vessel. That means all the fuel that's being burned for, by all five of those engines are all being consumed from just two boosters. Okay, All the other tanks on the vessel are remaining full. When those tanks on those two boosters um, are empty, you drop them. Then you're running on the main vessel and two boosters, all full. Now the fuel is being drained just from the two boosters that are remaining, while the main vessel remains still full, running on three engines. Okay? You do that until those boosters are done, then you drop those two boosters, and then you're left with a main vessel completely fueled up. And this does necessitate some adjusting of our staging to make sure the boosters get dropped in the right order. Let's see here. Okay, first those guys. Yeah. And then those guys. Yeah, that does it. And if you take a look up there at Kerbal Engineer, you'll see now that we have 4,629 meters per second. So we've increased another 300 meters per second. And by the way, I've been adding crap to this rocket all the way along as well. So I've been adding mass to this and I haven't added a stitch of fuel since uh, since we got started. So this, this does work really, really well. Let's just see how this guy flies. Three, two, one, lift off. Oh, oh, oh dear, lost an engine. Oh, 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 wait, what? Why am I popping? This is going to be a spectacular crash. Look at, oh! <laughs> oh. Okay. Some further adjustments are obviously required. Uh, I will remind people I am in simulation mode. <laughs> All right, trying again. Three, two, one. 
Okay, well, we've cleared the pad. There we go. So you can see now all five engines are being used. But the only um, tanks that are being drained are the two that are sort of on your right and on your left right now. Oh, no, no, the one that's forward towards you and the one that's at the back behind the rocket that you can't see. It gets a little bit confusing if you take a look at the way the fuel is being consumed on the engines. Uh, it does get a little bit confused, but you can see here, these fuel tanks are completely not being used, yet these guys are being drained, those top tanks already being empty. One thing you do have to make sure when you start dropping these rockets is that you drop them symmetrically. And you can do this with like six boosters and with eight boosters or however many boosters you have going around your rocket. Though it always has to be an even number because you need to drop them in pairs. And they have to be opposite pairs because you don't want to end up messing up the symmetry of your rocket. If, uh, you know, if all of a sudden the thrust and the center of thrust and the center of mass are not lined up anymore, uh, well, bad things are going to happen. Anyway, we're getting close, and you'll see once we separate these engines, if you take a look at the fuel gauges that are over there on the left, you will see how they'll all go full again. Alright, just about there. There they go. Alright. And now you can see the fuel's being drained from that one. That one's still full. That tank's there still full. And the main vessel in the middle is still full. So now it's just uh, all the fuel is being drained from the two boosters that are left. And we're only running on three engines now, but that's okay because we've shed a significant degree or significant amount of mass. So anyway, this should give you a pretty good idea of, I think, how this all works. I don't want to show the main vessel. I know you've gotten little hints and peeks at it under the fairing, but I actually want to save it for when I launch this thing for real. There's quite a lot I still want to do and tweak on this. I don't, there's lots of little things I want to add on it. One of the things being, I don't like the way it's flying actually right now on this, on this sort of angle. I want to, I want to fix that up, make it look better as it's going up. Uh, but that'll have to be for a future episode because as you can see here, this vessel is going to take 26 days to build. Well, I hope to be able to cut that down significantly by putting some more upgrade points into the vehicle assembly building. But to get those upgrade points, I need to uh, unlock some science nodes, some tech nodes. And to do that, I need to get some science. Hey, but that's what this mission is all about. This is the Kerpalo on its way to do a lunar flyby. And we're going to use the opportunity to talk a little bit about gravity assisting and how that all works. I think that's a worthwhile thing to talk about. I, I mean, I know a lot of pe people that play KSP a lot, I think, get gravity assists and how they work. But there's a lot of misconceptions about gravity assisting because the way it's especially presented in, in uh, popular science fiction is often very, very misleading. Um, also, you can see this guy has no asparagus staging. I was talking about asparagus staging in the first part of this video, and there's no asparagus staging here because I hadn't unlocked any fuel lines. And I don't want to give the impression that asparagus staging is the end-all, be-all when it comes to rocket design. It, it isn't. Um, it's it's a useful tool. It's a useful trick to have, uh, you know, to have it available to you. Um, because it does make very efficient use of engines. If you have engines that otherwise wouldn't be able to lift your vehicle uh, and provide the required amount of thrust, it's a great way to use all your engines in an efficient way. But there's nothing wrong with the SRBs like I have here. Anyway, we have three contracts that we're going to be uh, finishing off with this one we have uh well actually the first one we're not finishing off but we're almost finishing it off uh, there's two tourists that want to do flybys of the moon and then all i got left after that is to do a flyby of minmus with one of them and then that contract is finished off which is great this is a that's a big contract we have a return to kerbin after a flyby from the moon so that'll be easy as long as i gotta do is get these people back and then we have some collect some science from space around the room moon and well that's kind of what this mission is all about. The only thing that's a little sketchy about this particular vehicle is the SRB separation. They are stacked together pretty tightly. So uh, we're coming up to that separation now. And we just got to make sure that they all come off cleanly. There they go.
<laughs> okay, you heard those explosions, so uh, they didn't quite, they weren't quite clean of each other, but they came clean of the vessel, and that's what is most important. Here we are finishing off our circularization burn. Uh, you can see that uh, other than the two tourists, I have Bob. Uh, Bob is now a level one scientist, so uh, he's the one that's going to, since this is going to be primarily a mission about uh, pulling in the science, he gets a little bit of a science boost, so he's definitely uh, the one to have aboard this vessel. Let's talk a bit about the vessel. At the bottom there, I have a Terrier engine. It doesn't provide a whole ton of thrust for this vessel. This The thrust to weight for this vessel is about 1G, which is still plenty. Sometimes people get really concerned about that, but up here, I have another Terrier engine tucked in there above that cup decoupler um and that's there as kind of a backup engine i'll talk about it while bob here goes and collects some science from the materials bay that uh, we picked up on the way up the reason i have a backup engine it's not a separate stage to the rocket really it's there's a backup because i do have dang it installed and if that main engine at the bottom failed and that was the only engine i had on this thing um, these guys are in a lot of trouble. And because this is going to be a flyby of the moon and not a free return flyby, which I'll be talking about a little bit later, um, yeah, Bob, you're not going to be able to get in there. That one's full. <laughs> Bob needs to be in the top at the command module. Um, anyway, uh, if that engine failed and they were doing a hyperbolic flyby of the moon, which would, you'll see in a bit, will put them into a pretty large orbit around Kerbin, and that engine failed on them, and they didn't have any kind of backup. These guys are in a lot of trouble. So I have a backup engine and a backup tank. Because if that bottom, if either of the tanks starts leaking, I'm able to put fuel back into the other tank. Okay, so this is all about contingencies if things go wrong. I need to start getting engineers and trained engineers in order to uh, to uh, have these vessels go safely without having it. But I don't have trained engineers yet, so... You know, that's, that's kind of the way it is. Uh, let's talk about gravity assisting and the moon. So this is going to be a great opportunity to talk about gravity assist. Now we're going to do a transfer to the moon. So we're going to start by just, of course, picking the moon as a target. And um, I've already uh, sent vessels out towards the moon. So you've seen me do all this stuff and getting towards the moon. And it's about 860 meters per second to get out to the moon. So I'm going to just put that number right into a precise node. And there you can see my orbit, not particularly big, just enough to just get to the moon. And there I am hitting the moon. I don't want to do that. But let's uh, pull away from the moon and take a look. So we're, right now I'm coming onto the moon from this perspective on the right side of the moon. I'm, I'm going around the moon in a prograde direction. In other words, in the same direction that the moon rotates. And what I want you to do is take a look at the resulting orbit that happens because after my flyby and how big it is. Now, if I get myself further from the moon, look at my periapsis number, you'll notice it's getting further away from the moon. As I move further from the moon, that moon, that orbit gets smaller. The closer I am to the moon, well, there's my orbit without a moon insist at all. There's my orbit with a moon insist. And, and, and what's happening is I'm getting a gravity assist from the moon. The reason this happens is purely because the moon is moving. The moon is moving in a counterclockwise direction from our perspective right now. And so as we enter into the moon's sphere of influence, we start getting pulled along with the moon. And since we're moving in the same direction as the moon, because we're going around the moon in a prograde direction, it is adding energy. Here it's adding so much energy, it's actually going to kick us right out of, our, of the Kerbin system, which clearly we don't want to do. But it's adding its energy to us. It's pulling us along. It's sometimes described as being inside a slingshot. And then when we come out of this moon sphere of influence, we are much faster than what, we're, uh, what we were doing before we went into the moon sphere of influence. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my trajectory now so that we end up going around the moon in a retrograde direction. So you can see here I'm now on the other side of the moon. And I'm going to click on my periapsis so that uh, we can keep track of it. 
<clears throat> and the thing to notice now is our resulting orbit is much less than it was. Even though I'm just as close to the moon as I was when I was on the prograde side, my resulting orbit's much less than it was. I'm no longer getting kicked right out of the Kerbin system. And as I play around with it, I can adjust that resulting orbit. But the reason why it's less now than what it was before, <clears throat> excuse me, was be is because um, I am now going around the moon in the opposite direction to the way the moon is going around. We're going retrograde, going around the moon in a clockwise direction, but the moon is moving in a counterclockwise direction. So it's not boosting us as much. Now, the moon is still massive and close to Kerbin in, you know, KSP sort of scale. So it actually still kind of overwhelms everything and gives us a pretty good boost. But if I play around with... Uh, my periapsis height, and I actually have to play a little bit with the prograde burn, burn a little bit more. It's interesting that burning further prograde is actually reducing my resulting orbit. I can get myself to the point, if I keep track of this periapsis, I can get myself to the point where that periapsis actually becomes less than the periapsis of the circular orbit that I'm in, in right now. And in fact, I can keep going with this to the point where that periapsis enters into the atmosphere. And so right now, the moon is actually removing energy there. My periapsis, is, my resulting periapsis is now only about 40 kilometers, well into the atmosphere. So the moon is now reducing the amount of energy in my orbit. It's getting me back home and putting me back into the atmosphere. And that's because I'm going around it retrograde in a clockwise direction while the moon continues to go around in a counterclockwise direction. So the moon is removing energy. So gravity assist can actually be Gravity desists. They can take energy out of your orbit as well. They can work both ways. And this type of a trajectory is referred to as a free return trajectory because for the, what do I got here? 870 meters per second. I'm going to get out to the moon, go around the moon, come back, enter into the atmosphere and land without having to spend any other fuel. The thing is, is my periapsis is way out there. I don't want that. I want to get in close to the moon. I want to collect science. So what I have to do is increase my burn to the point, actually no, I'm decreasing my burn, I'm sorry, decreasing my burn and bringing down my periapsis, and I want to get it in nice and close, I definitely want to get it in under 20 kilometers, so I can get some nice low altitude or low near space science around the moon, but the problem is, is my resulting orbit after doing that is huge. So this is not going to be a free return trajectory, right? I don't want to end up in this crazy big orbit now. Um, I'm going to have to perform a further burn. And we'll talk when the moment comes about where and in what direction that further burn needs to go. But for now, this is the burn that I want to perform. And here we are coming to the tail end of that burn orbit is almost up there to the moon. I like doing this from the sort of view from the moon. Oh, there it is. All right, so let's keep pushing prograde. I love watching all the orbital lines dancing around as you do this. Just about there, and oops, I think I overcooked. Yeah, I overcooked it a little bit. I want to bring my periapsis down, so I think i to start doing this a little bit more slowly so I don't waste fuel on these uh, correction burns. Yeah, I want my periapsis down below 20 kilometers. I want to maximize the amount of time I'm in near moon space. A little bit of, a little puff should do it. A little more. Yeah, a little more. Am I? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, there we go. Now, if you take a look at the delta V left, it says I only have 156 meters per second of delta V. Um, That's, that's not right Uh, in this... Uh, Kerbal engineers all confused and what we'll do is we'll fix the fuel situation <laughs> sort of convince you of that so I'm gonna pump all the fuel into the main tank down at the bottom which is the tank that that terrier engine is using if all goes well that's the only engine I'll end up using and now you can see the true amount of Delta V I have left which is 488 meters per second so now we'll just time warp out to our moon encounter you know I mean, I'm so used to using alarm clock for all my time warps, but I, I haven't been playing with the ones that are built into the stock there yet, these time warp buttons. So let's let's try that out. So I'm going to hit time warp, margin equals three minutes. So I'm assuming that means it'll stop three minutes. Oh, oh yeah, of course. We've got science to collect. We, uh, 
the uh, bup, bup, bup. <laughs> the uh, science alert mod has just stopped us as we went into high curb and orbit. And uh, yeah, this is the first time I've actually had some science equipment out this way. So uh, we've got some science to collect. I've tucked a lot of the science down here in this little uh, little bay down there. In fact, I'll let Bob go down there and you'll, you'll see just how much stuff I do. He has to go down there and to collect all the stuff anyway and then reset all the science equipment. But uh, I'll go in there and I'll show you everything. I tucked a lot of stuff in there. It's pretty crammed. I got a goo canister. Those sort of hexagonal tanks, the long tanks you see to the left and the right of the goo canister are the life support. We have about, I think, nine or ten days of life support on these things for our three people. You can see I put a mount, all the batteries are tucked in there. So, uh, yeah, and the thermometer's in there as well, um, just on the other side. So, yeah, you can you can jam a lot into those little, uh, those little cargo bays. Okay, so let's try that time warp once again. And, oh, stopped. Electricity's run out. We've run out of electricity. Okay, what the heck's going on here? Are we in the dark side of Kerbin? No, we are clearly in the sun. But we have zero electricity and are not charging. Clearly, I did not put enough solar panels on this thing. There are, there's not enough solar panels to keep this antenna going. Well, that's okay. The antenna's optional, but uh, maybe I should pay attention to these things. Okay, we're charging now. All right, well... We'll have to try this again. So we'll just shut down the antenna. We don't really, really need it. And time warp again. Oh, there we go. Oh, we're slowing down. Are we come? I guess we're coming into three minutes to it. Slowing down. I'm not doing that. Something's doing that for me. And we have. Oh. Oh, the Otter 2 is complete. Oh, okay. Daughter 2 has to complete a, a mission. There's a there's a survey mission it has to do that I started actually at the conclusion of the last episode. So that's cool. I, uh, I don't know. I'd like to go and do it now, but I think I'm getting... There's Kerbin. I think I'm getting too close to the moon to really get it in there. I got to circularize first. So let's... Er, okay, now we're getting in. Oh, wait. What? I know we're now... Oh, I must... Oh, shoot. Man, I think I had at least a couple of hours after the Otter 2. I could have completed that mission in the time. Oh, well, have to do it later. Anyway, uh, time warping. You know what? I think in the future I'm just going to keep using Alarm Clock. Nothing wrong with these buttons, but Alarm Clock, I don't know, keeps track of things, I think, better than just these buttons. I got a little messed up. Okay, we're closing in to the transition to the Moon Sphere of Influence. Oh, jeez! Okay, and that's with the time warp off. This is why I like to be not time warping. I don't know. That spooks me. I always think nothing's fine. Anyway, we are now in high space above the moon, so time to collect all of that sweet, sweet science. Yeah, we got the materials bay. We've got goo canisters. We've got crew reports. We've got temperature scans. We've got an EVA report. Of course, I saved the EVA report for last, of course, because... Uh, because uh, Bob's going to have to go out there, collect all that science once again, and then reset all of the equipment. And then once that's taken care of, it's time for us to start thinking about setting up the burn to get these folks back home. Unfortunately, I hate to do this, but this episode is getting long enough, so that's going to have to be for the start of the next episode. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.